they already have him showing a tracking of her and that tracking caused the tracking of him. So what goes around comes around. A woman's Snapchat location acted as a map for her killer who tracked her down via the app and shot her in cold blood. All this before he left her body in a shallow grave and fled the country. And then you start step by step, not only putting together the facts, but the circumstances surrounding the facts. And those circumstances solidify those facts and almost puts the puzzle together for the government in a way where it's almost glued together and it's not going to move. The case is judged calling it an obsessive driven murder in the ultimate act of domestic violence. And so it's more than just a murder out of anger or something like that, but it's based upon a relationship. All the facts adding up, leading jurors to a quick deliberation. This shows there was a lot of planning. There had to be a lot of, of his own investigation as to make sure who was, he, who was who, who was involved, where were they involved. And those kind of things really give strong evidence to the jury as to, yeah, this was premeditated. It was November 2022 when 43 year old Carrie Allen was last seen while out on a date in Omaha, Nebraska. She left behind her teenage son and a laundry list of unanswered questions. Did she leave on her own or was something more nefarious at play? Carrie's ex-boyfriend, Aldrich Scott, was originally charged with her kidnapping, but those charges were quickly upgraded to first degree murder, use of a weapon to commit a felony and tampering with physical evidence. Investigators say social media played a large role in Carrie's murder. Here's criminal defense attorney Mike Corbanix. Well, it's an interesting case because it's sort of a way that evidence has been changing since all this innovation of computers and cell phones and things of that nature because I don't think a lot of people realize everything you do on your phone is recorded, not only verbally, but physically. They can look at your phone and tell where you are. They can look at your phone and tell where you were. And that helps the government or any prosecuting entity with putting proofs together because it's so computerized and it's so solid as to where the phone was and what the phone said in it. Investigators say Scott's phone held many answers in the case, including how he tracked down Carrie. The pair were friends on Snapchat, the app used to send pictures or videos to your friends with filters or effects. Snapchat also includes a map feature that allows friends to trace each other's locations if that feature is turned on. Officials say Carrie's location was turned on and Scott used it to find her. And I know that you said this is something for the prosecution because they can go through and track where your phone was, the text messages that were sent, things like that. But in this case, the defendant, Aldrich Scott, I believe that he went in and looked at Snapchat and the map and tracked where his ex-girlfriend was. Does that raise any red flags for you? Well, it actually is. I mean, cases are built piece by piece. So to build proof beyond the reasonable doubt, you need to slowly put your puzzle together. And it seems every which of the every which way you look at this case, from what the evidence we have, we don't know all the evidence in the case, but they already have him showing a tracking of her, and that tracking caused the tracking of him. So what goes around comes around. It also gets me thinking in the day and age of technology that Snapchat could, you could have your map on with whoever is your friends, they can see where your location is, or your iPhone, how you can share your location with whoever you choose. Does this make things more complicated for people who could potentially be victims more at risk, let's say? Well, that, that's a great point you just made because it shows both sides of the fence. Because we're talking about it from the legal aspect of how do you prove a case. But there is a much more general aspect that makes it, yes, I think it would be concerning for people. And sometimes I wonder why people post things on Instagram and things of that nature, because it's, you may be thinking something, but it's always good to reflect before what you say to make sure it's okay and it doesn't expose any problems. Here's the thing where it's a problem because I'm sure his emotions were running high. He was having probably some sort of breakdown. Now then you start step by step, not only putting together the facts, but the circumstances surrounding the facts and those circumstances solidify those facts and almost puts the puzzle together for the government in a way where it's almost glued together and it's not gonna move. Investigators say Scott used Snapchat to find Carrie, who was out on a date with someone else in Omaha. When Scott found this, he went back to Carrie's house and waited for her. 
he shot and killed her when she got home. They were dating for a while and then things got broken off. Harry, the victim in this case, starts dating someone else. And then we have the defendant who comes after her and murders her. Does that scream domestic violence to you? Oh, absolutely. But the thing is, the murder charge is much more serious than the domestic violence charge. So that's where he got the, the, the whole prop, the whole length of a sentence he has, which is basically, although it's not life, but you know, if you're over 40 or that age, that term is almost equivalent to a life sentence, depending on, you know, where you're going with it. The, the big thing is though, with the fact that he got found guilty of the murder and one of the underlying offenses was domestic violence, that also, I think, builds more evidence to the jury as to the motivation of to why he did that. And so it's more than just a murder out of anger or something like that, but it's based upon a relationship. Not only did Scott use the app to track Carrie, he drove about 160 miles to her home in Omaha, Nebraska, from his home in Topeka, Kansas. And to me, it seems pretty obvious that it was premeditated. I believe the jury agreed with this, obviously. But first of all, we have him looking at her Snapchat location and tracing her that way. But then additionally, we have him driving from Topeka, Kansas, all the way to Omaha, Nebraska, about three hours. So does that to you scream premeditation as well? Absolutely. You brought up an excellent point. That's why I like being here because I'm learning from you as well, is the fact, yeah, he had time to sit. This is not something where he was driving by, you know, a situation where he's driving by, had a few drinks, something like that, and sees his ex-girlfriend with someone else and snaps. This shows there was a lot of planning. There had to be a lot of, of his own investigation as to make sure who was he, who was who, who was involved, where were they involved, and those kind of things really give strong evidence to the jury as to, yeah, this was premeditated. This wasn't a mental breakdown. There's some, some sort of sympathy for it. That erases it all, in my opinion. A body matching Carrie's description was discovered about a month after she went missing. On December 23rd, 2022, investigators confirmed it was Carrie. And what's interesting to me is that in the reporting, it shows that she was in a shallow grave. This is something I see a lot. And I know forensics is likely a big part of the case for the prosecution going through and getting DNA, et cetera. But why is it something that would be widely reported or is it of note that she was found in a shallow grave? I think that gives a person sort of the feeling that she was in a shallow grave because this person wanted to just get rid of the body, hide it and get out of there. So they were doing something at a very quick pace so they couldn't get caught. It's like driving at a high speed when the police are chasing. Let's pause the story of Carrie Allen for a quick second to thank Morgan and Morgan for sponsoring today's Law and Crime News Package. It's stories like this that remind you, you never know what's going to happen and that the world is an unpredictable place. So when you're hurt, it can be confusing, it can be scary, and sometimes you don't know where to turn. We'll enter Morgan & Morgan, America's largest injury law firm. You can submit a claim in eight clicks or less on your phone, and then you can find out if you have a case. If you do, your injury could be worth millions. In the past couple of months, they've gotten verdicts of 12 million in Florida, 26 million in Philadelphia, and 6.8 million in New York. Also, they have over 1,000 lawyers, so you know you'll be in good hands. So if you're injured, you can start by submitting a claim at www.forthepeople.com slash lcnews or by dialing hashtag law. That's hashtag 529 on your phone. Now, back to our story. Throughout all this, Scott flees the country and heads to Belize. He starts working at a restaurant on Kay Calker, an island there, and befriends the restaurant's owner. The owner told investigators Scott lied about his name, but the owner figured out who Scott was when he did some digging. The restaurant owner then contacted the U.S. Embassy, and Scott was arrested and taken back to the United States. What do you make of that, him leaving America? That really is strong circumstantial evidence because that shows he was aware of what was going on and anyone who was, felt they were innocent would stand, exercise their constitutional rights of their right to remain silent and proceed with this matter. So that's always a problem in any sort of case because 
the government will always try to bring up the fact that that's a sort of admission of guilt while you're fleeing the jurisdiction. But that's also a very sensitive kind of fact sensitive motion that would be made to see if it was in fact that aspect is admissible to the jury. That's when Scott is charged with first degree murder, use of a weapon to commit a felony, and tampering with physical evidence. Additionally, one of his charges was tampering with physical evidence. So we have the first degree murder, which makes sense because we do have a person who was killed, and then tampering with physical evidence. What sort of um, actions could have led to that charge? Well, that, that's an interesting question. Those are very fact sensitive as to what you're, you know, how you destroy the evidence, things of that nature. If you have a gun, and you all of a sudden you tear it apart so that you can't find fingerprints or things of that nature, then they would, that would be a strong argument that, listen, if he didn't do anything, why did he destroy his gun? If, if he had a legal gun, things of that nature. So that's where the implication comes in, I believe, in destruction of evidence charges. The case went to trial back in March in Omaha, Nebraska. What goes into deciding whether a client should take the stand in their own defense? That's a very, I, 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 I'm laughing inside because it's always a very difficult thing when you're defending a case because the burden is on the government for proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Defendant doesn't have to prove anything. The thing that is always at risk if you put a defendant on who has exposure is that he may open the doors to confirm something the government's arguing. If you're arguing like he, 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 he was never there and all of a sudden there's questions asked and you find out maybe he says I was somewhere else, but it was close to the point where he was, that gives you arguments saying, well, wait a minute, he was near there. He's the one who's saying it, but we have proof. And that questions credibility a lot. So it's, uh, it's always the client's ultimate decision of whether or not they want to take the stand. And like I always say to like, a client is, is as long as you're going to be truthful, but if you think you're going to get over, it's one client against the government who has a lot of investigators and facts that they've gathered. So you need to be careful of what you say. And in this case, ultimately, Aldrick Scott did decide to get on the stand and testify. He said that it was self-defense that he went and approached Carrie, that they got into an argument, that she was the one who pulled the gun, and then the trigger went off and she ended up being shot. What do you make of him saying that this was self-defense? Self-defense would be a, could always be a valid defense. However, the facts surrounding self-defense, because I would think as a prosecutor, the first case we'd ask, well, if it was in self-defense and you did nothing wrong, why didn't you call the police to report the crime that was against you? And I don't think you need many more questions after that for effectiveness. It's always quantity. It's not quantity, it's the quality of the question. And sometimes one question like that could say, have the defendant saying, why did I even bother taking the stand? After days of deliberation, jurors returned a swift verdict. If we're taking a closer look at the jury, this was placed in their hands and they only deliberated for about two and a half hours before coming back with a sweep, all guilty on all counts. What do you think about that short deliberation time or is two and a half hours a short time to you? It really depends on the, on the facts of the case. And, you know, sometimes jurors just happen to just all be in sync. So it comes back, it seems, you know, it's a unanimous jury. It's not a it's not a preponderance of, you know, the, the majority of the jury, it's unanimous. And obviously, if a jury comes back in two and a half hours, that would give them, depending on how many counts there are in the indictment, enough time to reflect and decide, especially in a case like this, because it didn't seem like there were a lot of witnesses, quite frankly, it was really just technical, the defendant and the defendant was most of the evidence and whoever investigated it. Local reporters following the case noted that apart from his testimony, Scott remained emotionless throughout the trial and later at the sentencing. So we know that we heard from him while he was actually on the stand. Obviously, he answered questions from both sides. But then other than that, the reporting shows that he had no emotion during the trial or the sentencing. But to me, that sounds like something maybe his defense attorneys could have told him ahead of time. Don't react. Don't cry. Don't have any crazy reactions when somebody is saying something. What do you make of that, that he didn't really have any emotion during all of this? I don't find that 
harmful to him at all. And I think most attorneys would say that um, because of the fact is, number one is there's court rules and that you, you're a defendant, you, you have to be respectful to the court. You're not allowed to jump out. You're not allowed to yell. You're not allowed to voice your opinion. It's a courtroom. I know we have had recent trials where the defendant <laughs> says whatever he wanted to, and even if the judge ordered him not to, uh, you know, Trump was a, in that case, that was a, that was an unusual situation having a defendant speak out that much. So I don't think there should be any sort of judgment as to someone acting respectful in court. That shouldn't show their guilt or innocence. That should show their respect for the court. And you don't want your client, you made the great point is, you don't want the defendant reacting because the jury sees a reaction and they could misinterpret that reaction. Somebody could roll their eyes back because they don't believe it to be true, but somebody could interpret it saying, oh, he rolled his eyes back because we caught him. Who knows? Without further evidence. Sentencing for Scott came on May 30th. When it came time to sentencing after he was convicted, he was sentenced to life in prison plus 45 to 60 years. Can you that, explain that to me? Because to me, life in prison is the rest of your life. Why add that 45 to 60 years? That most of the time is just a technological thing that you have to do under the law is to sentence as to each count. Some counts can run consecutive, some can run other ways. Another way that could be done as well is, you know, this case could be getting appealed. Just because you're convicted by a jury doesn't mean the case is over. Therefore, if a sentence is in a consecutive manner, that way, if say the life sentence, they said, all right, that sentence was illegal or that conviction wasn't, whatever he got sentenced to the other consecutive part could still stand and you know he's back on that, on that and he's going to be having time. So it does protect against the appeal. So you brought up the appeal. That was actually my next question, because as we know, he testified saying this was self-defense. So if he believes that and wants to move forward with that, maybe he really believes, hey, I shouldn't have been convicted here. Do you think that there could be grounds for an appeal? Well, there, there always could be grounds for an appeal, depending on what evidence went in, when it went in and how it went in. But uh, that also could be a, a strong argument, but it just seems like he's got a tough road to, to go down. But Let's face it, it's very difficult to decide what an appellate court's going to be because how many times have things reversed? We've been going through lately seeing what the Supreme Courts have reversed and people are in shock over it. But that's the way it happens. And it's, it's, not, it's not like law is not always, especially trial work, is not like a science where you can say, all right, we're going to have A plus B and it's going to equal C. There are a lot of different things that come in unexpectedly and things that change. Do you think, based on the facts as we've discussed today, that there was justice served in this case? Absolutely. If the judge, it appears the judge sentenced, the judge is only responsible to sentence. It's the jury. And I think people are forgetting about that. The judges just are basically like referees. The two teams decide who wins. And that's what decides who wins, not the referees. It's the points scored and the people who are keeping track of the points are the jurors. And I think that's a very strong argument. There's no word yet whether Scott plans to appeal his case. As for Carrie Allen, her family has been very outspoken, saying her murder has created an immeasurable loss for her teenage son. Reporting for Long Crime, I'm Sierra Gillespie.